Thank you all for joining us for tonight's webinar, Your Last Phase of Planning. I'm Greg Berry, Assistant Director in the UAB Office of Alumni Affairs. Just a quick note, since we are virtual, don't be surprised if things may seem out of place or a technical issue could pop up. If you experience any issues with your video or audio, please click the, re clicks, rather, the reconnect button at the top of your screen. This will get you back to the webinar right away. Tonight's webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded onto our website tomorrow. If you have any questions throughout the evening, please place them in the chat room. We'll have time for a Q&A at the end of the presentation. So at this time, I would like to introduce Carol Donovan. Carol earned her BS from the UAB Class School of Business in 1985. She has three decades worth of experience in areas such as contracts, financial and retirement planning, life insurance, and tonight's topic, pre-need planning and at-need funeral services. Carol currently works with families throughout the Birmingham area and throughout Alabama. At this time, I would like to officially welcome Carol to the webinar. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome, everyone. Um, I am so glad that you decided to take some time to be with me tonight and uh, either have dinner late or you had it early. I'm um, so glad you didn't have to come out in the cold as well. So. I really enjoyed the webinar part of what's going on in the world today. Um, this will be the only real colorful slide that I have. And it's just to illustrate that no two of us are alike, that you're one of a kind. And that's what we want to talk about when you plan ahead for the celebration of a lifetime. Uh, a lot of people don't think about planning funeral services for that outcome. Pretty much it could be a sad time, but a lot of people, I think, would like to look forward and look at the celebration of a lifetime. All right, here we go. Next slide. <laughs> hmm. There we go. Okay. So what is pre-need planning? I jumped the gun right there. Hold on a second. There we go. Pre-need planning is just like any other planning. You really do a lot of research. You know what you're going to do, but you maybe don't know how to do it and you don't have all the information you need to do it. So basically you're gonna collect a lot of the information that you would need at the point in time when your loved one passes away, which is what we call an at-need conference. Um, vital statistics are needed. We would need that for the death certificates at the at-need conference. So why not have that during your pre-need planning, which would include the parents of the individual that passed away. Uh, we need to know their exact name. We need to know where the uh, loved one uh, was born. And of course their date of birth, social security number, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of people talk about things that they have, but you don't know where they are. So a very important part of the pre-need planning is to let someone know where the documentation is located. And that can be a burial and life insurance policy, as well as other financial assets that may be needed or used at the time of the at-need conference or that can be used in the pre-need planning to avoid that at the time of the loss. Um, one of the things that bothers me is if there is no pre-need planning, um, depending on the person that this responsibility has fallen to at the at-need conference, they may be very young, it may be a divorced parent, and they may be the only person, excuse me, that is going to handle this. So they are really at a loss to know who to call, where they're going to go, what kind of place do they have? Do they have a, a cemetery space in a country at a country church? Or is it in a funeral home or cemetery here in the local area? Or is it somewhere else? So it's very important to let them know or whoever is the power of attorney know um, the plan of notification for the deceased, regardless of where they will be residing. 
Now, if they are in a skilled nursing facility or an assisted living facility, at the time the person is admitted there, these are the questions that they will ask so that if that should occur and they need to be transported to a funeral home, then they will know where to transport them. Uh, also, what is good in that situation is they will know who the proper person is to direct them to make sure that the uh, loved one gets to the right place. If not, it could result in additional cost um, to whoever's providing uh, financial support. Um, funeral arrangements. Okay, it's very important to know if there are any first, number one, if there are any cemetery or burial arrangements. And keep in mind, those are two different things. A lot of people think funeral arrangements covers everything. In actuality, you need to think of it as inside and outside. I know that sounds a little crazy, but inside means funeral arrangements that is the actual funeral itself. Who's going to speak? What kind of music? Do you have pictures that you want to show? Um, the flowers on the casket, the casket itself, the minister, um, the funeral home that's going to preside. The cemetery is the outside part. So that would mean anything on the outside, which would mean the space that the person would be buried in, the cemetery space, or it could be cremains to be buried, or it could be if they're in a mausoleum as well. So there's a lot of specifics here that would need to be known. Um, and then in pre-need planning, you can plan, but if you don't execute the plan and finance it, that's all it is, is planning. So part of the goal of pre-need planning is to save the family that's left behind the um, heartache of trying to plan now when um, maybe resources are short or they don't know where the money's coming from. So the prepayment of the funeral and burial arrangements is a, a big part of that plan. How can it help my family prepare for the loss of a loved one? Just like I just said, financial assets and insurance policies will be known prior to the loss. And uh, in specifically talking about that, uh, in the state of Alabama, a lot of you may have heard or maybe your grandparents have had the Brown service policies that you've heard about uh, that are now administered by Liberty National. So those policies need to be available or if you can't find those, um, we need, you need to ask the funeral director to search for those at the time you're in that at need conference. Unfortunately, we are not allowed to do that at the pre-need stage. You can call yourself and find that information, but we cannot do that. They only will let family members do that. But if you don't let us know that at the at need conference, then you won't get the full benefit that you could uh, helping you with the finances at that time. So that's very important. Another important part of how it could help the family is the wishes of the loved one. Because for example, let me give you some ideas on my own personal experience. My late father-in-law was a US Army veteran and he also uh, was in the um, National Guard. So he did some pre-need planning but he didn't tell anybody what he wanted done at his funeral. But he did have his funeral paid for. And my husband's mom passed away when he was young. So he remarried. He remarried a lady that lived in Tuscaloosa. But she moved to Birmingham. So she had cemetery spaces in Tuscaloosa. So when he passed... I thought, well, shoot, he has all his friends here in Birmingham. So I'm not going to have just a service in Tuscaloosa where he's going to be buried by her. So I had a 
service here in Birmingham, a memorial service. And back then, there wasn't such sophistication of DVDs and that sort of thing that's now available or streaming. So I did a collage of all the photos with the blended family and had that here in Birmingham the night before. And then the body was taken to Tuscaloosa where we had a graveside service for him. Now, this man had his uniform in the U.S. Army in his closet for 40 years in a dry cleaning protected bag. No moss had gotten in it. He was the same size. So I decided he would be happy if I buried him in his uniform. So I did. It made me feel good anyway. And then I called down Montgomery and found out that I could get him a 21 gun salute. So we called them out and we had that service. And it was just so, so exciting for me to feel like I did something for him he really would have appreciated. Now, unfortunately, right now, you'd have to be a high ranking uh, <laughs> officer to get that 21 gun salute. But anyway, that's what I did for him. So that's when you look at wishes of a loved one and knowing what they might like to do, if you could find out that prior to them passing as well, that would be good. If not, it'll be left up to you to be creative and think what would they really like? How would they like to be memorialized? And what would bring pleasure to them if they were here? Um, so that's one example that I have. Um, and of course, the family members need to know when and whom to contact at the time of loss. And we've already kind of gone over that. Now, I would like for you to um, let me know on the chat who in the audience has planned a funeral at the passing of a loved one. So there'll be a poll that will come up and just, I believe you'll answer yes or no. And that'll and that take is, that is correct. I've got the poll up right now. Have you ever gone to a funeral home to plan a funeral when a loved one passed? We're going to keep this up just a few seconds there, Carol. Um, we do have a, a delay with our webinar be, between what we're saying and what you're actually hearing. So we're going to keep that up for a moment. Right now, Carol, it's overwhelmingly yes. We're looking at right around 80% has gone to plan a funeral when a loved one has passed, right at 75% right now. So wow. we'll go ahead and close that poll, Carol, and, and we'll show people the results and you can continue. Okay, so it sounds to me, I mean, most of you probably would have wished that it had already been planned ahead of time. Um, let me give you a couple more examples. Um, my mom did all of her pre-need planning. She picked out everything. It was just fantastic. All I had to do was go in for 15 minutes, pick out the flowers, go over her obituary where we wanted to have it posted. And that was pretty much it. So she liked things her way. And, and I did pick out the dress and I hope she liked it. But um, that went well for her. In another situation, um, my late husband, we had been talking about where we wanted to be buried, how he wanted to be buried or cremated. And I wanted to be cremated and he did not want me to be cremated. So we were kind of looking at places and areas. And unfortunately, he went in for open heart surgery and had some complications. And so after a couple of months of getting better and getting worse and getting better and getting worse, I decided I would go ahead and go in um, to one of the places we'd talked about and do some pre need planning, hoping that he wouldn't be mad when he got out since I already did it. Um, but on the other hand, thinking, what if he didn't get out? I don't know how emotional I would be and how hard it would be for me to do that. So I went ahead and put it in place, made a compromise. I wanted to be cremated because I did not want to be buried in the ground. So I found a mausoleum and bought a companion mausoleum, put it on monthly payments, which I thought was gonna be there for a while. But unfortunately, he passed away in three weeks. 
Well, because I'd already done the pre-need planning, um, I was able to go in and spend again about 10 or 15 minutes. And that was it. Uh, picking out the flowers, already had the obit done. But he liked special events. He liked to be re remembered for something that no one else had ever done. So he was a physical education major and he played golf. Um, he played basketball, baseball, I should say softball, never football. So I thought he would like a celebration of life to bring all this to fruition in some way. Uh, and he also bowled, that's right. So after his chapel service, I decided we need to have a special event. So I found a place that had four bowling alleys in a private room, a pool table, and a lot of great area to have food and drinks and not alcohol drinks, but you could. Um, and so we could, you know, talk about him and share all the experiences. And it, it was just wonderful. Everybody really enjoyed it. So there is another way when you think about all these things, uh, if you have this kind of planned out ahead, then it's just so much easier and it helps you in your grief as well. If people feel like that they're doing something special because they're losing something special, then I think it really helps you to move forward and feel like you really honored your loved one. So now back to the slide. How do you plan for cremation? Um, in the past, cremation was just cremation. And basically what used to happen is you would find a crematory and the person would go in, be cremated and come out and either be put in a cremation box so that the cremains could be spread either outside or in the lake or somewhere like that or in an urn and put on a mantle. Well, things have changed. I don't know if you realize that you can have about the same service for someone who is being buried in a casket for someone who's being cremated. And how that works is like this. So if someone wants to be cremated, but you wanna have a memorial service at the chapel, at the um, funeral home, or if you wanna have it at your church, that's okay too. So this is what you need to decide. Would you like a viewing of the person before they're cremated? You can have a viewing, have all the same things. You can have a slideshow, you can have flowers, uh, you can have pictures, everything. And then after that memorial service, they can be cremated. And then the, the uh, urn can be brought back and buried or in a space if they have one at the cemetery. Or there's so many other things available now there are niches and a niche is basically what you call a secure place in a wall that you put the cremains and it has a granite or a marble front and with a nameplate, nice brass nameplate um, on the front and that memorializes them in a special safe place. It can be one, two, three, four, or you can put someone in a family type niche, which means you have four to six. It's its own private columbaria is what we call it. So that's one way they can be memorialized. And we have a bench. So a bench is very nice, I think, a granite bench. And then you can also choose two, cremations, four, or up to six. And you have in memory of a nice bench to sit on, plus have the cremains in there. So there's all types of options now available. The other thing you could do is just actually have memorial service 
and go ahead and have the body sent to be cremated and you just take the cremains home with you. Um, so there's a lot of options out there. Now, the other thing that I have found is that some people in the past did take the cremains home and put them on the mantle. And as they've gotten older and maybe one of the spouses has passed, they've got the cremains and the other spouse is getting older and they're wondering who's going to take care of both of us and our cremains in these vases once we're gone. Or who should we ask to take on that responsibility? Do we really want to do that? So in that situation, you can then decide to have one of these niches or a mausoleum or a bench and go ahead and have a service if you would like, or just have a private memorial and place the cremains in there of the, lo the loved one that's already passed and then have arrangements with the, the executor, whoever you trust in the family to do the same thing with yours. So again, there's a lot of options available out there and I know it varies one-on-one -on -one, and that's why we like to meet with people one-on-one -on -one because there are so many things to look at. Now, Irrevocable contracts used for burial funds. Um, some of you may have heard that there are funds that can be used on the spin down of assets for Medicaid qualification. And this kind of crosses over into the attorney side of elder law. But I wanted to bring up the fact that irrevocable contracts for burial funds can be used to set aside money for burial for those individuals that may run out of money, either with long-term care funds, their individual funds uh, from their income um, when they go into Medicaid and therefore they wouldn't have any money or would be limited to the money they could use for burial. So in that situation, irrevocable contract is what would be used. I would recommend that if that's the situation you're looking at for a five year spin down, that you do talk to an elder attorney and get that sorted out. I work with one for my mom. The other thing you may not realize if everything is wonderful, um, that you can preclude any cancellation of a prepaid service, which if you purchased a pre need funeral, for example, by another person by also making it irrevocable. And I know this sounds unusual, but if you get a contract on prepaid funeral and it's revocable, you pass away, someone comes in and decides they don't want to bury you in the casket. Say, say you purchase $10,000, for example, they decided they wanted to cash that out and maybe cremate you instead. Well, if they are the sole heir and nobody else is around, they could do that and keep the difference in the money. So the way you avoid that is to make it an irrevocable contract so nobody can cancel that and your wishes are there and you will get everything you paid for. So I know that sounds kind of funny, but that is one of the things that you can do to protect yourself. Um, next, on military benefits, a lot of people want to know what's available. So in order to qualify, you have to have a DD-214 from the VA and it allows some burial benefits, but it's based on the type of service and the length of service and it can get complicated. So I really don't want to go into a lot of detail in this group presentation because it's better to do that when we look at the form on a one-on-one -on -one consultation. But basically, um, what you would get if you um, qualify, and I'll tell you who is eligible in a general way, military members on active duty, 
military retirees, members, and former members of the Selective Reserve, U.S. veterans of any war, and other U.S. veterans who served at least one term of enlistment and separated under conditions other than dishonorable. Okay. So what you would get is a flag, and you would get no less than two members of the armed forces, one of whom is a representative of the parent branch of the service of the deceased veteran. And you would get two of those people, and they would play taps either by a bugler or by an official electronic recording. And typically, we see the bugler. So that is something that is available. If they qualify and want to be buried in the National um, Cemetery, then a lot of people think, wow, it's, they're going to pay for everything. No, that's not true. What is paid for by the VA Cemetery, the National Cemetery, is the space, the vault, the opening and closing, and the marker. Now, what you would have to pay for, or the spouse would have to pay for, and whoever's in charge, would be the actual funeral, because that is not paid for by the military or the VA. So keep that in mind. The other thing about this is you cannot pre-need a space and reserve it in one of these cemeteries. It is a an at-need basis only. You can be approved in advance that you will be approved, if that makes sense, uh, at the time of loss. Okay, you can do that. So, but there's a lot more pieces to the puzzle. So those kinds of things can be discussed later, or I can also, if you email me, send you a link that can go into a lot more details on that. So where to go from here? Since a lot of you have had the at need experiences, which is what we call it when a loved one has passed away and we, we have not done any planning, um, we have the worry side because we worry because we don't know what to do or we may know what to do, but we're not sure everybody wants to do the same thing. On the pre-need experience, it's already clear. Everyone's talked about it. The loved one knows what they want and agrees, or they just leave it up to everyone else and it's already been done for them. Um, anxiety is very high, as you know, at the at-need experience. Because during that time, as you know, you only have a window to get this done. And it's usually about four days from the time someone has passed. Most people want to have the funeral service and the burial within four days. So that does not give you a lot of time if you don't have all the information available, the financial funding and the property and everything else. On the pre-need side, you're, you're comforted because you already have that in place. The at-need experience, again, you always doubt did I do the right thing? Did I do enough? Did I do too much? Can I do it? Um, Pre-need, you're certain because it's already been done. You're going to grieve at both the at-need and the pre-need, but you're really going to grieve at the at-need because it's just so much besides the loss of the person that you have to deal with at that time. And the, the at-need conference, as you know, only lasts two hours, maybe three. So everything has to be planned, done, paid for, and then you have to go do all these other things to get ready for the funeral service as well. On the pre-need side, there's just no pressure. Like I told you in my examples, all I had to really do was go in and say, okay, this is the day, this is the time I want the service, this is where I want the obituaries to go and I'm going to get my own flowers and I need your help planning this extra event. And that was it. At need experience, there's always going to be unanswered questions uh, when it's over. I've had people come back 
who did not get a memorial book um, because someone in the group said, oh, no, we'll go get a book from Michael's Hobby Lobby or something like that. The signing books, what I'm talking about, but that book did not have the little folders you get, the handouts that has the information about the funeral, the obituary, as well as maybe a verse or scripture on it and thank you notes that you can hand out. So they came back after the fact and asked me if we could do that. And I said, yeah. I said, why didn't you do it to start with? They said, well, somebody told me, you know, it cost too much money. We probably didn't want to do it. And then they decided they want to do it, which you can. Um, again, on a pre-need, you've already picked that out. At need, financial and emotional stress, pre-need, peace of mind, and there's no regrets. Let's talk a little bit now about pre-need planning and funding and how that gives you price protection. Um, when you purchase a pre-need plan and fund it, what happens is you lock in the price, today's prices of both the funeral and the property and the vault. If you're getting a cemetery space, you have to pay for an opening and closing a marker and a vault and the property, like I said. So that's locked in today. If you might live another 20 or 25 years, you can probably imagine what the prices could be then. So that would protect you from inflation. Now you probably heard about these burial expense policies and life insurance. Why couldn't I use either of those instead of doing it this way? Well, you can, but it does not protect the pricing. That's the difference. When you purchase it from a funeral home, it locks in the price, no matter what it is 20 years from now, you are good to go. I had some folks that purchased something, some property, for like $150 per space. Well, spaces now, you know, range, gosh, it just depends on where it is, what cemetery it's in and all that. But you've got some, you know, that are as high as $7,500 or maybe more. So you can see that, you know, the inflation is a big deal. On the side of life insurance, typically you buy life insurance so that your family can maintain their standard of living, keep the house and other things when a loved one passes away. It typically should not be used, in my opinion, to pay for expenses, uh, death expenses for the loved one who has passed away. So if you do that again, life insurance is here and then the expenses and the prices of the actual funeral service are going to go like this. So you're going to eat into this amount if it's a long time period and then your actual family is not going to receive near what they need to survive because inflation is going to continue on this side as well for living expenses um, for the rest of their life. So that's why it's important to do this on a price protection basis. Just keep in mind you can do this on a monthly plan at no interest. You don't have to pay it all out of pocket either. So that is another good point to look at. So what I'd like to say to you today is a little preparation today spares your loved ones from much anxiety and confusion at a later time. And that is a gift of love only you can give. And I think that's something that speaks volumes uh, about planning. And if you follow through with that, I think that's the most important thing you can do for your family to keep them happy or as happy as they can be once you're gone. Okay. And your last step in your 
last phase of planning. In order to move you forward, and I'm so glad you came tonight because I think you're really interested in doing that, um, is to schedule a free consultation to review your plan or to develop a plan. Now, a lot of people think they have a plan in place. So that's the thing. If you would like to see if you have covered both the funeral side and the cemetery side, the burial side, I'll be happy to look at it for you or to actually develop a plan. Um, you will receive the consultation at the consultation, a complimentary personal planning guide. And this will document 90% of the information you need at the time of passing of you or your loved one. So I want you to feel comfortable in calling me or texting me at the number 205-381-7716 or email me at my email address to get started. So thank you again for coming. If you have any questions, um, I'll try to answer those uh, as long as they're not personal in a personal situation. I don't want to get into that kind of thing. I, uh, you know, I'd rather do that one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you so much. Fantastic okay. information, Carol, that you've given us. We do have questions coming in. If you do have a question, go ahead and toss it in the chat. Carol's phone number as well as her email address are already in there, so you can find that information there. We'll also be sending that through follow-up email tomorrow for everybody that wants to get in touch with her. So with the questions, so how can you be sure a company doesn't go out of business for services that you've actually paid for? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, most funeral homes now um, have trust that the money is put into for the services you purchased. So they don't actually have access to that money until such time that the person passes away, then we have to request the money. That's one thing. The other side of that is um, you're more prone to have an issue with that if you're dealing with um, one owned cemetery. In other words, now there's a lot of corporations out there that own a lot of cemeteries. So that's primarily what you're talking about and funeral homes. And so based on that, that that is going to keep that from happening, uh, unlike it has before in the past. And I know what you're talking about. There are some locally owned that have had major issues and gone bankrupt. So that is a very good question. Next question, Next question is, is there any coverage for transport to a national cemetery? Um, well, now that depends on how you're looking at that. We offer a package and, and I don't know if this is exactly what you're asking or not, but we offer something that if you are on vacation or away, you fall sick and you pass away and you're in Hawaii or you're in Spain, uh, we do have something that would allow you to come back here at no cost to you, regardless of how much it costs. Okay. And it's, it's a very small amount of money, a one-time deal. So we do have that, but yes, there, there are costs um, over 35 miles that they would charge you per mile to transport you from one place to another away from your home. Yes. Can an individual be buried on their personal property in Birmingham? And what about burial on church property in Birmingham? Very interesting question. I had a man ask me that in an in a at need conference recently. There is no Alabama law that says, and I looked it up, that, that you cannot be buried on your personal property. However, it has to do with the jurisdiction you live in. So a county could say, no, you cannot. And so it all depends on local jurisdiction and not the state. As far as the cemetery at a church, uh, I've never seen an issue with that. If they have an established cemetery, that most likely would be okay, I would think. Do you think Do you a retirement, think retirement savings, savings would recognize pre-need as a reason to make an early withdrawal? To do what now? Make a what? Would a retirement savings be recognized as pre-need in order to make an early withdrawal? 
Probably not. I wouldn't think so. That would not be a hardship, but unless they've changed the rules on that, um, that would be a question for your benefits um, provider. I don't, I mean, I used to do that for a living too. And, and I haven't seen that, you know, that it would be a hardship. Now that's something I could look into though for you. If you're the child of an elderly parent, do you need power of attorney to make these arrangements? If your uh, parent has Alzheimer's or anything like that, uh, and they, you know, they're not of sound mind, yes. If not, uh, probably no, because you can't force them to do something just because you think they don't know what they're doing. Does that make sense? <laughs> If they agree to the power of attorney, they have to agree to that unless you go to other links to actually get that done through an attorney that deems that they are not of sound mind. And remember, if you do have questions, go ahead and toss them in the chat room. Can you comment on cemetery and state receivership because of the misuse of fund? I cannot. I do not know. Uh, we've had several people move some of their family to our cemeteries because of that. Um, but I really don't know the law on that. Okay. Fortunately, I have not been on that side. <laughs> and that's so, fair enough. Yeah. So, so donating, donating your body to science. We have a couple of questions regarding this. How does that fit into your last phase of planning? And how do you find the right organization to donate to? Well, you know, um, there have been several organizations that actually solicited me for my late husband and my mother and asked me, could they have their eyes? And I said, sure. So I would think, you know, um, on your driver's license, on their driver's license, if you have, you're a donor, uh, they'll probably know that. And I guess the hospital uh, lets them know that you are a donor. And that's how pretty much they would find out and say, hey, can we have, they would call you first and say, can we have these organs? Um, for research, I would think somebody like UAB actually would need to know that you wanted to do that or another institution that does that. And the last question, unless somebody else has one to drop into the chat box, could you comment on cremation and the signatures and permissions needed for this in Alabama? Um, yeah, you have to have a signature and permission for everything. For example, uh, even when a body is brought to us, we have to have the permission and signature on embalming. So we would have to have number one identification of the body before it's cremated. And right now, most funeral homes, uh, I don't know if it's a requirement. I'm not on the director side of it, the funeral director side, but they do take fingerprints and retain those. Um, so to verify the body, somebody has to do that in both instances, but primarily cremation for sure before the body is and I know yeah. this probably can vary with the, the answer to this question, but what is the average cost range for a full service, including burial? Okay. Believe it or not, I'm not just saying this not to be able to give you an answer, but believe it or not, we are not allowed to give you a range. And the reason is I have a list of all of the pricing for my particular funeral home. And by law, I have to be able to hand you this in order to tell you that. So I'm legally uh, bound not to give you that answer because it would violate the law. So I can't do that, unfortunately. Suppose you have purchased a plot in Birmingham, but then you move to another state and wish to be buried in that new state. How do you sell the plot in Birmingham? Okay. Um, what happens there is that uh, funeral homes do not have real estate license, so we will not sell it for you. However, you can go out on Marketplace, uh, Facebook, and put those up for sale. 
in general, you would probably want to advertise it as costing less than what the current price is. And then someone will reply to you and come out and take a look at it. And then the, the funeral home facilitates the transfer. In other words, you negotiate with the other person, the money exchanges between the two of you, you come in, sign the paperwork as an affidavit and everything that yes, you are the owner and you are, you know, selling this to this person. And then there's a transfer price for the agreement to be executed and that's it. Okay, so is embalming an option or not an option in Alabama? Um, it is an option, but we have to get permission either way. For example, some religious groups do not allow embalming. So we have to know why and get a sign off on that as well. Thank you, Carol, so much for taking your time out of your busy schedule to be with us tonight and giving this difficult, but yes, necessary presentation to our uh, alumni and friends. Thank you so much. And a reminder, recording of tonight's webinar will be available online starting tomorrow. And be sure to join us for other upcoming webinars that we have in our webinar series. On Tuesday, February 8th, we'll take a look at upcoming destinations you can embark on through our travel program. These experiences include trips to Europe, the Canadian Rockies, and Antarctica. We'll be outside Bartow Arena on Thursday, February 10th for Men's Basketball Alumni Day. Be sure to swing by and grab some UAB swag and snacks before heading into the game. It's free, but we ask alumni to register just so we know how many snacks to bring with us. Have a student or UAB or at UAB or coming this fall, join us for searching and applying for scholarships on Tuesday, February 15th. We'll have a small panel available to let you know what's available and where to look. They'll also be ready to answer your questions. On Tuesday, April 12th, be part of Diet and Brain Health. During this webinar, we will find out what our diet needs to look like in order to protect and maintain our cognitive function. And on Thursday, May 19th, laugh it up with Dr. Kevin Fontaine during comedy. Just say yes. Find out what makes something humorous and why laughing makes us feel better. They say laughter is the best medicine, right? You can register for all of these webinars at alumni.uab.edu slash events. Let us help you get through your day or your commute. Listen into the UAB Green and Told podcast. New episodes are released every other week and are available on our website at alumni.uab.edu slash green and told. And you can also download the podcast on Spotify and the Apple Podcast app. And be sure to stay on top of everything, all things alumni through social media. You can look us up by searching UAB alumni on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter on LinkedIn. Search UAB alumni career community. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for tonight's webinar with Carol Dunavant. Have a great evening, and as always, go Blazers.